Already. I should be live. Let's see how my levels are. I've got this cranked up kind of extra loud, so maybe I'll dial it back just a hair and uh, see how we go with that one then. Hello, anybody who is here who will not be here just yet. And welcome to the coding stream, my post-holiday coding stream. <coughs> yeah, as you can hear, I'm not super well, but, you know, that's typical for me, I guess. And we can hang out and do something with the one person who's apparently here. Hello, where are we? Oh, no, they went, they went away again. Oh, geez. I could just sit here and do meditations. Um, or I could fire up the video stream and we will talk about uh, what to do today because I haven't really decided yet. There were a number of possibilities. And among them, some of these ones that, um, like this I'm in the middle of doing, this maybe not so much, here's another list of things that would be good to do. Here's an interesting one, the idea of modulating an all pass, that might be cool. That's something I've not tried yet probably would also make for a good face shifter. Some of these things relate to stuff like a future version of uh, to vinyl. Here's the, hey Bo, here's the sorting algorithm thing. I think it's very little chance that I am done with doing that today. Uh, I was going to do a version of Glitch Shifter without intelligence because there's an old Akai sampler that's known to do um, interesting nasty pitch shifting by just doing the nastiest, crudest version of that possible. I can answer questions if people have those. Definitely going through some of these things. I never got around to doing the golden ratio dither, the uh, Gaussian-ish thing, which was just increasingly small numbers of random source and figuring out what the correct volume would be for that. This one's already done. These ones are sitting on the desktop waiting for me to do them. And yeah, I got my usual uh, list of things, but one of the things that might be good to do is um, some of this reverb stuff. Because the thing is, oh yeah, and here's the old Olympic Helios idea. By the way, did you notice that I was showing off um, Ardor on the hilariously failed uh, video that I made. I have fixed what was broken about that. What was broken about that video was I had OBS trying to process with uh, two changes, one of them, actually three. There's a problem. Um, one of them was a uh, upping the bit rate slightly. I went from like 18k bits or something like that or 180 something like that to 200. 
I don't think it was that though. And then the other thing was I set the optimization. No, I can't today, Bo. I set the optimization to um, film rather than no optimization. What that does is that chooses to apply blocking less in the video compression. What that means is the video compression is not looking as hard for solid areas that are unchanging. And it works pretty well for animation. And for film, you're kind of assuming that that's not going to be happening. But the real thing is that uh, I set the CPU hungriness from slow to slower. And I believe that's what did it because I just did a little test recording when I started doing this. I just did a little test recording when I started doing this and found that um, it was fine this time, that it wasn't making something that was unplayable. So that was my mistake on the video. And whenever it zooms into another thing like, uh, like this, for the video that I made, where it's the camera is in a little box, and the uh, other parts of the screen are doing something else, even when it's a video game. The um, the recording worked, and then when I switched back to the regular camera, even though it's a fixed camera, it's on a tri, well, it's not really a tripod, but it's a fixed camera. See, the reason that wasn't working is because that's a camera feed and I'm compressing really, really hard with a very, very high bit rate, meaning that it was doing its level best to capture um, noise artifacts from the camera sensor, even right down at the dark area of the range. And even though it's not an especially noisy camera. So asking it to compress more, if it was showing like the desktop, the desktop literally doesn't change. And if it's showing the video game, most of the video game doesn't change. But if the full screen is camera feed, then the full screen had very, very fine noise that you couldn't really even see but it was enough to blow up the compression. And so I did a video of the most recent plugin, namely Acceleration 2, that gave me one frame per two seconds for most of the recording, which was a half an hour. So yeah, sometimes, sometimes these holiday seasons leave me just being a big pile of mess, and sometimes that's just how that's gonna be. But I'm working on moving forward uh, beyond some of those things. Again, I will focus on answering questions and if people have them, because that's fine. I might not have good answers today, but I will do my best. And if we get to the coding, like this stuff here, we'll get to the coding and that'll be fine. But, uh, oh, by the way, if I do start getting two frames a second, tell me about it but I don't really expect it. So, coding in Ardor. Ardor is famously the open source project that spawned Harrison Mixbus. Mixbus is based off of it, which probably also means that you can use Mixbus and run console or console seven inside it and have, that, uh, have it be arranged properly so that you can use the faders in Ardor or Mixbus, that's what I was doing in the recording, was running just a couple of tracks inside Ardor and mixing them, and it did have console engaged. As far as coding Ardor, that's the thing. Ardor is a open sourced uh, DAW. It's perhaps the key open source digital audio workstation. Let me fool with my gain levels a little bit. So as such, um, it 
you can get all the code and download it and modify it and change it to be whatever you want legally. It's GPL, in fact, so I wouldn't be able to use my MIT license. I'd be using something that was even more restrictive and more... It's funny, because you, you would think that something like the GPL, you wouldn't be able to sell it, because it's very draconian compared to something like the MIT license. With the GPL, you must make all the source available and encourage people. Everything that touches the source also has to become GPL. And you... Uh, are giving people the means of producing the same program by default for free every time. And the twist for that, as far as running Ardor, is that it's apparently really hard to build. I see no reason to, to doubt that, by the way. Um, I had a look at what it would take to do it. They are not recommending the use of like homebrew or anything. I don't know how much of that is accidental and how much of that is on purpose, but they don't recommend using homebrew or whatever to download stuff. That's a way where you can often go, oh, my compile needs the library, this and that and thus and so and libssl or whatever. Uh, homebrew, install, libssl, whatever, and it'll go and do that for you. But that won't work with Ardor, because Ardor apparently requires a whole bunch of really specific versions of things that aren't necessarily the newest versions of things. And uh, as such, you have to manually build all of the pieces of it, of which there are dozens, before trying to build it, which is also a fairly demanding task. I don't know what order you have to build them in. They're giving them in an alphabetical order. That's not necessarily the order. Um, some of the things might have dependencies of other things. And if you're using a newer version of something, the compile might fail. So they might have a means of making money off of open source builds that is simply charge people for the binaries, make all the source available, but have the compile be such a bear to do that nobody's going to deal with it. And so when I was making my video, I had the um, binary of Ardor running. It was not one that I had built. And you can tell that because it nagged me like every two minutes. It was constantly shutting itself off or shutting its audio off. And I'm like, no, Ardor, please. I'm promoting you. Give me a break. But no, no break for me. And again, this is also the same thing that Harrison Mixbus is built on. Hey, Gamma. Now, the other thing about that video was that I was showing people uh, cluster fluff. I've decided I'm not going to bother giving it a good name. I'm not going to bother doing audio for it or anything like that. It is a open source project, so other people can take it and run it. And that is the video game that I've been talking about for a while. It's the one that is actually the video game done in uh, Godot Engine that I had gone and like visited my brother a bunch and I was coding it while he watched because he was looking to try to understand how it was that I coded things and did things. Because again, this is the brother that was like, you seem to not think. So he did not understand how I arrived at anything. And he thought that watching me do a game would help. Um, and it didn't help. It kind of only confused him worse because I was doing my usual thing of trying to change about five things at once and going towards some nebulous target that I could not define. And that's kind of where that left off, but now it's out. So I've got links to a Mediafire page where a bunch of the binaries for Clusterfuff are built. And there's also, and this is the part that's interesting to me as far as moving forward with some of this stuff. 
in particular talking about uh, Godot engine is somebody building games for some game jam talked about a way of posting stuff built with Godot directly on GitHub. Now it turns out it's not really convenient to do that um, with the binaries. Like I, I put them up and found that the, the Mac binary was too large to even host on there. And then GitHub also complained to me about having me putting binaries up. And it just turned out to not be a great idea. But the Game Jam guy's advice was to build your game in Godot or whatever. And GitHub also has a facility for pages and Godot can export as HTML5. Meaning, Godot has the ability to export some stuff that it puts, you can, in, in your little GitHub repository, which is a thing that you can do if you code, you're building something in Godot engine, and you uh, set it up in its little folder with all of its little parts and the things that you're including in the program, you compile it, you upload it to GitHub as a Git repository and maybe use the Git program to more conveniently keep track of that stuff. And then there's a whole bunch of source control. What that means is you can get old versions back, you can roll changes back, you can incorporate other people's changes, that I don't know anything about. And GitHub also is letting you set up pages. That means you can upload your HTML5 to GitHub, have your, you know, source code available somewhere where if it got super popular and people freaked out about it, for instance, they wouldn't be charging you directly because it's hosted on a third party site. It's like having a YouTube video. You're not getting charged for hosting the YouTube video because YouTube is doing that. If you're putting open source code up on GitHub and it's publicly facing, they're not going to charge you for serving that open source code to people who are trying to find out how, to, how it works or whatever. And since GitHub lets you associate a page or a HTML site with that particular project, you can upload the working program to GitHub, go to an internet location and run the program. Godot lets you do that. And so that's what I've done. As of just yesterday, it went up and went live. So that means anything I can think to do in the Godot engine can be put on an internet page where everybody, who, at least everybody that's running like Chrome or whatever, um, can use it and I'm not actually being charged bandwidth for them using it. And that is exciting because on the one hand, it's all well and good doing stuff that's just interesting. It's all well and good just doing stuff that's like, I just want to do this and like I'll go to HostGator or whatever. I've had some problems with them, but I have been using them for a long time um, and host a website. The problem comes when you're dealing with something they used to call it like getting slash dotted and uh, Hacker News is also an example of this where the wrong people hear about the project that you're doing and suddenly hundreds of thousands of people are trying to download your thing or look at your page and the site goes boom but if you're doing this stuff with an open source project that is hosted on github that's basically being hosted by microsoft and they will let any amount of traffic as long as you're not hosting big files they do have a special way of doing big files where you can pay them $5 for 50 gigs of space and 50 gigs of bandwidth and so on per month. And you could host like binaries and stuff there. But if you stick to these smaller sizes, I don't see any bandwidth limitation. So it's an ideal place to do small projects or creative things where it might just be you doing it or who knows, maybe there will be lots of people paying attention to it. Either way, it's accessible, like it's not going to break or fall apart or die anything. 
and that video game in the in the video is also up on the github page if you go to the github page for cluster fluff and there's a link to it like right up at the top right you click on that wait for like 10 minutes maybe not really 10 minutes but it's a good like 80 years well 30 to 80 meg some something in the ballpark there and you'll be running the game in the browser because it's web assembly and that's a interesting prospect because there's lots of stuff that one can do that's not just plugins i don't think i can make a daw in uh, the godot engine although if i did that would be pretty cool if you made a daw in the godot engine that would be like either a, a 2d platformer daw or a 3d daw or something like that but you can't necessarily do a DAW in the Godot engine, but there are many utilities and things that you could do. And I'd like to talk a little bit about one of them, seeing as I'm not coding yet. I briefly showed during one of the windows of time where I had no frame rate, some of the card game stuff I'd been talking about. I've taken some time to uh, color code regular old playing cards and associate them with uh, some parameters like density and clarity and uh, complication, uh, simplicity. So this is a sort of theme cards. And the way you'd play this is you'd deal out some of them. We'll say seven or something like that. And you'd try to construct a uh, coherent, I, I'm going to come up with a scoring system for this as well, a structure for, say, like a, a progressive rock um, song, where red would be like fast, fiddly, intense stuff. Orange is for lava. I've got, I've got themes for all of this stuff. And you can't put things directly next to each other. You've got to sort of echo them. And you'd be getting higher scores based on the amount of repetition you were able to include. So if you had like this here, it would be a fast and fiddly thing followed by a uh, heavy metal lava riff, the heavy, dense, and hot. And then a blue area. Blue is actually... It's associated with water, and it's those the, the bits in a prog song where it, the beat goes away and everything just flows. And then back to the heavy lava riff again, and purple is the opposite of blue. Purple is smoke. Purple is, rather than being the liquid form of that, it would be a different style. I would describe that as the... Uh, the water form would be close to the edge, the middle part where it's just pipe organ. Whereas the purple, the the smoke form would be heart of the sunrise right at the beginning. And that that uh, goes red, purple, red, purple, namely. And then the weird keyboardy things that are happening would be in the smoke category because they're sort of light and floaty and there's no time signature for them. So it's like, in order to be able to do this, I also have to get cards printed up that have this drawn more effectively. And these lines going across them have significance. You would be seeking that there are different uh, adjectives, different categories, uh, polarities of things. And what you see here the second one from the top, the black and silver are opposites. And this black line means that both of these types of arrangement have the same heaviness. I think that that's associ either associated with heaviness or something else. So that needs to be written on the card, which I can't do because it would be 
writing over Sharpie and uh, I'd need to have it printed to do it properly. And you'd get scores by coming up with stuff that would either continue or would repeat a color because rep repetition legitimizes. Adam Neely will tell you that. Or does a interesting clash like with this arrangement, you've got whatever this top thing is, is uh, silver, black, immediately over to silver, immediately over to black. So there's striking juxtapositions there compared to what else do I have? That's, this, that's what makes this a game is it's tricky to figure some of this stuff out. And I'm trying to work out how that would work. Like if you had, say, this set of cards, you've got a echo of these two here. And then the, whatever this category is up at the top, silver, silver, and then silver before switching to a uh, a black, the opposite of that adjective. You'd get a higher score because this would be a through line. It's literally a line across the card. It counts as a through line. And yeah, I've been, I spent a bunch of time working this one out, but it, in order to play it, you'd have to be able to see what the, the lines mean. That stuff needs to be drawn on the card. However, I've done another set of cards where I basically just modified a regular deck of cards to get some characteristic uh, decks and cards to use rather than being diamonds, hearts, clubs, and spades. I've overridden them and made them be the eight colors I'm using with the theme stuff. So you get the 19th of water. 19th of fire, the seven of grass, 19 of sand, the X of fire. I was thinking I can do something about there's an X, a Y, and a Z card for each of these suits. And you'd have them match. You would come up with some kind of riff that would be uh, echoed repeatedly. Or you could just be told, do a 13. And I decided you could do uh, 11 or 13 or 17 or 19 with these larger prime numbers here. If you draw an 8, you're either using 8 notes or you're doing a timing that is an 8. A 12 gives you 3s, and a 0 probably means uh, one of those washi periods where you don't have a tempo going. And basically, I just made a whole bunch of possible cards for just ways of coming up with funny time signatures as a game. And then lastly, the finally remaining thing. Everybody is speechless. I can I understand why you're speechless. Remember the circular wheels of fifths, the wheels of chord changes and how I've been doing the synthesizers to pursue those in a random fashion, make them into cards. And this is the most promising one yet because I can have the card set up so that sharps and flats are uh, blue backed and the naturals are red backed. So I did that. And then I've got these other ones here. I took every chord on my circle and drew it out so that it was kind of pointing sideways and going around the circle so that if you were doing the chord changes within a theme, you'd be on this horizontal line. Whereas if you jumped up or down a fifth, it would be going this direction. Then if you do that, you can deal out a set of cards. I put, put these because I picked out the cards where they're easy chords to play. 
on a guitar. Not that you can't, you can play any chord on a guitar, but um, I wrote these out so that they had easy chords to play on a guitar. And what you do is you put them out. Let me see if I can get something coherent here. Let's see, there's a couple of variations. And let's see, there we go. Don't mind me, just making a sequence here. I'm trying to find, I'm actually trying to find the card that has D7 on the top because that's what I've drawn. It may or may not actually even be there. Okay, so I'll do this with only two cards. It is very inadequate, but it's the best I can do for now. Actually, no, here's a third. And that means if I can find a B minor up here, I'll, I'll be holding these up. At some point, I'm going to have another camera for showing how this actually works, assuming I go forth and do all of this. So here are some ways to assemble these. If you had these two cards, see how F sharp major is on adjacent slots? You could set up a sequence where pick a point and go through usually to the right and downwards, and you wind up with a chord sequence that will work and do something interesting. You can go A7, D7, F sharp minor, a7, D7, again, is basically what that gives you. But there's more, because you can also skip into the middle of a card. Here's another one. A7, D7, F sharp minor to B minor. And if you have the B minor, you could play another card down here, meaning that you could do A7, D7, F sharp minor, B minor, E minor, and then you could go to A minor from there, you could go to G7 from there. Wanna hear it? I'll grab a guitar and show you what that did. And I have a previously worked out one, much like Julia Child doing this kind of thing. You will be hearing it off of um, this guitar I'm currently working on. You'll also be hearing it off of the electric condenser microphone, so forgive me for that. We're just being really informal today. Hear that? So, the chord sequence I was telling you about, A7, D7, F sharp minor, B minor, E minor, to G7. I've actually got G7 written down as a harder one to play. So we got lots of seventh chords here. And this is something that I just got out of the top cards of this deck, which I will very likely make and sell copies of as a fundraiser for some of my DIY synthesizer stuff. But you can go about it like this. You A to B7, and then, and that's minor as well. Let me get this wire out of the way. Erg. Now notice that is a set of seventh chords, and it's also covering like uh, here, let's start. Let's start. Let's avoid those seventh chords and hit only the G7, even though that's a little hard to play. And let's do a different sequence. We'll 
we'll start with the D7 this time. And again, I'm, I'm going right and down on these cards. So let's see, D, F sharp minor, B minor, E minor to G7. I wonder if I can go from the G7th to something. Here's a card with the G7 in the right position. So if I went to this one, it would tell me that I could go to B minor again, which is true. I could also look for the G7th in the middle of one of the cards, but uh, so G7. So yeah, let's see. If I started in the B minor and just kind of went around, oh, hello, come to think of it, B7, I got a G7, and going across that card, it goes G7, B minor to F. And I also have an F sharp minor. How did I determine whether a chord should be a seven chord or not? That is based on those charts of chords that are also on my website. It's a fairly recent post. Those circular charts. The seventh chord is, see when I've got, I'm, I'm seeing the chart across the room here. So if I play the stuff that's in the major C, the white keys of the piano, I got A minor, C, D minor, E minor, G7, B minor, and F. Those are a series of chords that all sit on the white keys of the keyboard. They are the modes. And when you get the seventh chords, that means you're in the Mixolydian mode. So you're using the same... Let's see, I, I can actually do... Uh, like one over from that, I think is, I'm looking at this thing from across the room and trying to figure out what I'm doing. Uh, my eyes aren't what they used to be, man. I think maybe, So if you were in this mode and you start from G, you're in Ionian. And all the chords in that particular slot will fit in Ionian. And the D7 fits in Ionian. It all fits in that mode. But if you started from D, And that's a Mixolydian mode, if I'm not mistaken, I might have it wrong, but point being, that's where the seventh chords come from. There's also a section for Locrian mode that's even weirder, and there's also a section for Phrygian mode. Same deal. If you started on, I believe it is the one that I'm at, B.
Phrygian mode. And that's when you're starting on D. Now what these cards do that you can't see right now, but I have done them, is it's starting to spit out possible chord progressions out of this kind of thing, where you start with something like, for instance, if I did B minor, D seventh, F minor, That's within the same key. So this is going to be, uh, let's see, I can actually figure that one out. That's actually the same key as the C major. So this would be a chord progression in the Phrygian mode. got all this worked out it's just done to the best of my ability but the point being if you're on that card and you're moving from left to right you're staying within the key if you shift up or down you are shifting to an adjacent key shift to an adjacent key you're only changing one sharp or flat and I've actually taken and written the sharps and flats on the card too so when I change from this card to this card in other words pursue the line that I was doing of I started with a7 d7 f sharp minor which is echoed on this other card so I'm using it as a transition and then B minor. I'm going from a card that has an F, a, a G flat or an F sharp to one that has an A flat, D flat, E flat, and G flat. I've made a bunch of changes, but they both fit with F sharp minor. And then when I go from that to the B minor, that can take me to one that has no sharps or flats. So this is a potentially weird uh, key change but it doesn't have to be because the B minor exists in a simpler uh, arrangement of sharps and flats and the F sharp minor can also exist with just a single F sharp so what you can do is ignore the fact that it's gone into all these funny sharps and flats however you can do A seventh B seventh, F sharp minor to A flat minor. That would still work, but it's going to sound like a big jump, but it still makes a strange kind of sense. So you can go. Now let's search through the cards a little more because that's what we're doing to see whether I can find up oh, yep another a flat minor that exists on one of these cards see this one with all the sharps and flats the a sharp minor is here so I'm picking one where there's a matching card we're skipping into the middle of that card and then switching back out of it again that can lead us to D. So we can do a sequence where we're starting with D7, F sharp minor, A flat minor. Actually, wait, that's not even A flat minor. What am I talking about? Let's. Let 
there's a really flat minor. It's G sharp, in other words. And that can lead us to D. So I wasn't actually playing a, a flat minor at all. So what that would really sound like is... F sharp to A flat goes like this. And that can actually lead us to D again. Those are all in the same mode. So to, to get back out of that one, because that, that A flat turned out to be something a little bit weird, we had a sort of multi-card configuration, went through four different cards going and we can go to F from there if we wanted to. But you can also go back to F sharp minor. And that's a sequence of chords that's going through multiple sharps and flats, but makes a kind of sense. Now, since this is uh, not drawn on the cards very well, and I'm struggling with it a little bit, I'm going to whip out some other ones that I prepared earlier that came out of different uh, single hands of cards done that way, for instance. Also do G minor. Or see B minor F and F sharp major. This is all in the same cards. seventh in there as well, but it sounds perfectly natural, doesn't it? And I think lastly, I came up with a B flat seven, E minor, A major seventh, which is also on those cards. And that sounds like... one hand of cards in this chord card game. Here's another one. Wait, where's it my B flat? It's... There's my B flat, there we go. Hear that? I went from a D major to a D minor, and it made sense. Can't 
find my way. <laughs> That's like can't find my way home. Except for I think there's little changes in there, but. This is the part. Can't find my way home. But hear how it goes from the major to the minor. And it makes sense because it's bouncing off that B flat and the B flat is coming from the E minor. So E minor to B flat major actually makes sense in certain modes. And then the B flat takes you to the D minor. And then you can go to the F G minor. Again, another hand of like three or four of these cards stacked into, and I am indeed working on the lyric writing thing, it's not done yet. So that's kind of, the idea with this is to give me something to do uh, to solve the problem of having the synthesizers making up the chords for me and them not doing a very good job of it. Because the, the, the flack that I got around the posting console 7 wasn't that much fun for me, so I'm looking into reevaluating that stuff. I've been evolving it for years, evolving the ability for the synthesizers to make up their own chords on the flies for years using this exact thing, but the trouble is they can do that, but then they don't necessarily have a larger scale structure. They don't have like a sequence of chords like this that will repeat. And that's why I've dove into all this other stuff like, let's design a uh, song structure that goes from water to earth. And the earth is an eight and the water is a 100. I don't know exactly what that's supposed to mean, but it's a, it's a little bit like the uh, Brian Eno's cards. Of it's just supposed to get you thinking. You're supposed to just make something interesting up. So if you've got earth in eight that goes to water in 100, that doesn't mean you pick 100 beats more like, okay, so you go full on with whatever this water theme is to be. And then you say, okay, my earth theme is B minor, E minor, B flat. And then the water theme goes to this other chord progression here that's also based on the same cards that I used for coming up with the, the first chord so everything will hang together. Yeah, oblique strategies. In theory, pulling enough of those things together, and again, these ones aren't ready. The, the themes with the numbers in them, although it's kind of interesting having like, you know, draw 13 for your fire card, therefore you have to make a riff in 13. That's all very well, but this might not be the win. This might not be the best. It does have things like, you know, here's a 16 and a five, both in smoke, or you can draw you know, in my fire suit, do a 13 with the theme of stone and just make something up based on what that would mean. Pretend that I could tarot or something. You draw the card of purple in the 13 and everybody gets really baked or anyways, which wouldn't include me because I gave that up long ago, but I would not be blame anybody for going, dude, and you'd have a little structure of these set up. And this is what I might be able to do something based on for um, building it in, say, the Godot engine. So I could generate stuff like this and make it so that you could set them up to do these things. And some of it would be pretty straightforward, like, you know, D minor, F, G minor, or A minor, D minor, F, G minor is a pretty predictable, simple chord progression. 
this doesn't have to produce results that are all weird and crazy. But it can, and when it does, they make sense. They make harmonic sense. So that's that's kind of exciting. And that will get me away from the problem of having uh, my little jams to demonstrate plugins sound incredibly unmusical because they don't have to just be little jams anymore. I can write stuff with structure and I'm like reasonably good enough to be able to play it fairly well. So uh, it's just a matter of discipline and having the structure to work with. And the problem with using the synthesizers in random generation there is it does give me the the randomly chosen chords and stuff like that, but it doesn't give me structure because it doesn't have any of its own. So I'll do a, a take and go like, okay, let's play bass over this that jams around sort of the C minor area until it wanders over to B flat for no particular reason. And I just gonna, I kind of just have to follow it. And that's something of a hindrance. I mean, the fact, the fact that that's a challenging thing for the synthesizer to just make up off of its, the top of its head, cool, but kind of irrelevant because nobody knows it's doing that. And it's very clever for a machine to do, but it's not really composition on a human scale. So let's bounce over to this. One of the things I was thinking of, and now I have like another hour before I can go and crash. I'm glad I showed you the, the chord stuff though, because I feel like that's really starting to take off. On airwindows.com, the original chord charts that I drew all that from are posted. So theoretically, you could draw that, you could draw this deck of cards yourself. The way it's done is every spot on that chord chart is like arranged kind of like this, where they're going around in a circle and going from left to right means going from the end, the outside of the circle to the center of the circle. That's the direction that this goes and it wraps. So if you get to the very end, which in, in the key of C is an F, you wrap around to A minor, and the A minor, you show the F on the far side of it. So it's, a, it's like a toroid, it loops. And then the other parameter, which is vertical, is going around the circle, the, the big circle fifths of chords. So you could get a few decks of cards and draw this out. The, the theory, and as you can see, I've written what the the notes of the central chord are. I've written what the sharps and flats are on the edge. It's hours of writing this stuff down, but to good effect because unlike, for instance, these, getting Sharpies and writing all of this stuff down gave me a usable working deck in this way. It would just be a matter of doing it more nicely, but it is doable um, if you got a couple of decks of cards and some Sharpies, as long as you understand the method by which it's being done. But yeah, actually I forgot I was in postage stamp size because we're looking at this area now. So what I was going to do here is I thought it might be nice to start some of the ports to VSTs. Have people seen any of the ports to VSTs yet? I think I've not been doing them because they're not as dramatic as starting from a, uh, starting from nothing and making a plugin. I do still have preponderant, so we could dig into that some more. But I could also do some of the work to port either matrix verb, reverb, or you haven't heard infinity, have you? That, I can actually think of something that might be worth doing to infinity, so maybe let's take a moment and check that out. 
and you tell me whether you think this is making any sense. Like here's our snare silence thing. And as you remember, the, uh, the reverbs that I have are like, here's our matrix verb. And this and the one that I'm just calling reverb are the ones that are based around the work I was doing to get the tone right. Uh, and filter zero is dark. Matrix verb is the one with the flavors. As you go to the sides, you start getting different uh, tonal colors going on. And then I did one that I do intend to put out, which is probably going to go into the starter kit collection. Reverb. Except for that seems weird, so I'm going to find out what happened. Oh, there it is. And this one adjusts a wide variety of things on just one knob. We got a dry wet. And we got big. So larger size is there. Smaller size. Medium big. And this is going to go into the uh, starter kit because it's approachable. Tiny sizes, sort of a room sound. A little bit larger. Actually, you know what I can do? Select a little area. So this is just the reverb plugin. And that's just your most primitive form. You could also use it on buses and things. I've thought that some of these reverbs will probably end up being used on submixes in console systems. So you can have a small one there. And again, this is all still using the same stuff that's in matrix verb, but it's all working as presets. It's all calibrated so that the big control gives you a variety of changes where the the decay of sound through air is built into it and the amount of sustain that it has is going to change greatly as you go to smaller or larger rooms but it's always designed to do something that's plausible whereas matrix verb is the one where you can do anything no matter whether it's plausible or not and this is the one that's just super accessible You can get a big, a slightly roomier sound. Or just ridiculously, impossibly huge. And that is the variation on matrix verb that is just entitled reverb. Again, the one that's going to go into starter kit because it's more approachable. And then there was one last one, and that's the one I'm thinking about now. Infinity, which as you can see, just goes forever. And there's some stuff in here where if you start introducing new sound, it will start supplanting the previous sound. But this one is absolutely designed to just go forever.
and we have the damping here so that it can kind of die away and become darker. The damping kind of goes from infinite, uh, purely artificial to natural acoustics. And then we have a filter that's literally on the output of it. And that is part of our uh, ultrasonic filtering that we had, except for in this case, it's built right in to do this kind of stuff. And it's independent of damping. And the idea with this one is to do your infinite reverb stuff. And then I've got your size. So you can pick like gong-like effects because it is a householder reverb so you can make it do infinite. That's what this is about. that to die out. What I was just thinking is might be fun to exaggerate size. This is our deepest size so far. It occurred to me, wouldn't it be interesting to do a sort of Frippertronic style infinite where everything that you played would start coming back at you faster and faster but the initial decay of it could be a lot more spread out. So to do that, I would need to firstly expand all of the, the delay buffers enormously so that your first echo would be like much faster than that. I mean, much slower than that. The first echo would be after a while. And then you'd hear the intervals between these much more. That might be worth experimenting with, I thought. Because the thing is, the way this works, I can do one that sounds like just delays. And you could play little melodies, and then little, the melodies will repeat themselves. But then it'll extend. Like, here is our note again. And then if we do uh, infinity here and crank it up all the way, damping to nothing, filter all the way up, you'll hear that we have our infinite reverb thing, but there wasn't a delay because it wasn't that long of a echo. So what, let's, let's take this and generate a few variations on it. Firstly, there we are. There is our infinity component. If we build this, it'll build and it will give us exactly what we had before. But we're not necessarily interested in that because we're going to modify it now. I want to get it where our initial beep goes beep, and then we start hearing all kinds of funny little echoes coming in later. And they'll start overlaying and patterning on top of each other. Might even be able to do a sort of test audio for it. But for now, here is all of our uh, delay times. And one thing we can do about this, this is a simplified version of matrix verb, is we can multiply it by a factor of 10 fairly easily. Let me have a look at the other code. See, it's doing this. We do seem to be running an all pass. It's A, B, C, D. E, F, G, H are the ones that are really significant here.
I'm wondering whether maybe there's going to be a... Uh, firstly, I'm wondering if I am actually doing a uh, all pass or not. I do appear to have, um, oh no, I have an all pass in front of everything. What that means is I can comment this right out, or I could if I did it right, like this. You know, if I build this, because that's the thing, the possibility of doing this a different way might be interesting enough to experiment a little bit. Let's switch out of here. And let's remind ourselves what we had initially as far as our note is concerned so that we can hear how it changes. We had this. But if we take that and do the version that has no all passes anymore, we get a slight change, which will be sounding like this. It still comes out to a fairly similar thing, but the initial sounds are a little more spaced out, which what we were going to do with this is expand this outward. So let's first of all have a little quick check and see what this looks like. I'm going to be doing delay A through H, and I can multiply them by 10 rather easily. That's 7, 9. Yeah, we've got some kind of fudge factor here as far as my variables, my variables are concerned. That should be basically fine. So, If I do this, all of these are larger, except for I don't actually need those to be larger because we're not using them. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Don't actually care about I, I don't think. I don't exa exactly know. Oh, and one of those was for pre-delay. I have some cleanup to do in this code. Uh, A through H are my main delay tank. There is our A through H. So. So let's go to that. I'm not using the vibrato, that's why it had an additional number. And if I multiply this by 10, all of those are now 10 times the size as well. And this is still not that huge of a delay tank. Like if you were gonna do a two second delay at 44.1K, you'd be using about as much space, if not more. But what we've done is going to change this so that now you can do this. And that's what your echoes will start sounding like if you have that much delay time in there they will kind of start turning into a little... It's not really going to become a Furpertronics thing. But you can kind of hear it doing its thing. We could also engage damping like this. And of course, filter is post everything, so that can just be used as like bringing this thing out of nowhere. 
I could make the filter go lower, honestly. But this gradually approximates a reverb path. It's just that the sizes of the reverb tanks I'm using are enormous. Let's stop this and try it on a different kind of sound. For instance, I've got this. Those are just sign notes, though. I'm trying to figure out whether I have anything useful for this. I want. I would want just a little riff or something. I don't think I have that. I could put drums. Let's just have a brief listen of what it would be like on drums. So if you just did that, then you did that with the infinity reverb. It would just start building up. But what I was looking for was something with a melody in it, which I don't think I have anything handy like that. But yeah, that'd be the largest possible size. So. It starts turning into a, basically a sound effect. Again, this is just drum kit. So let's pick something else that isn't drum kit. Like, maybe one of these will work. How about this initial one? No, that's not good. I want something that plays a melody. How about this? Matrix Verb could very well be next week. We were going to spend a little time porting it to VST today. Here's something that plays a note. So it starts with that note and then it goes to the higher note. So we'll hear what that sounds like on infinity. What I'd really be wanting is just a solo instrument. I do not have anything like that sitting around on this computer. Sucks. Let's see. start that over with the filter all the way up. So this is what this might sound like with the infinity reverb stretched out as far as it'll go. Still not happy with that. Tell you what, let's stitch that, make a new file. Can I do a sweep? While generating tones, let me do a sweep. No, it will not. Okay, that's unfortunate. Uh, no, files, I have no sounds to use. Darn it. The hell. That's most disheartening. I got nothing. I got nothing, guys. I cannot produce audio or musical notes. Uh. <laughs> well, let's scrap infinity for the time being. That's not the same as what it was, but hopefully I remember what I did. Let's spend a little time just building matrix verb, because that's discouraging. I have nothing that I can demo this stuff with. It just ain't. And I 
do need to do matrix verb so we can see what uh, effort goes into making that happen. Here's my template for the VST plugin. And we're going to open the AU version. Of matrix verb, which will show us some of the things we need to know, like MXVB is its identifying factor. That gets put here. Unique ID. MXVB becomes its unique ID. And it says change this to what the AU identity is, and that is what I have done. So also, Here's how we started with this. We're going to have to duplicate all these things. And we have seven parameters. That means rather than cutting this back, we're actually going to have to make it even bigger. Because matrix verb has so many damn parameters. Hmm. I'm looking at my metrics on the, on the YouTubes, and it seems to be claiming that everybody left at 12. Oh, no, apparently not. It's just freaking out. I feel ya, web page. I feel ya. I'm freaking out too. So, seven parameters, huh? That means I have to add some more. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're going to call that F and G. And make sure to update these. And that becomes the next thing. So now we have a enum, which is the number of parameters we're going to use. And there's going to be seven of them because that's how big matrix verb is. Now we also have this. That means those are my parameters, so I need to make a couple more of those too. FG. Now I need to adapt this to the format of the VST plugin to do exactly what matrix verb did, except for matrix verb is dual mono and the VST plugin is stereo. So I've got to double this all. There's an exception. When I do long double by quad, I can use a form of the biquad filter that has stereo built into it. Not so for some of these other things, though. So we're going to take this area, stick this in. You'll notice that this does not light up in blue. That's because there's no such thing as a float 64 in the VSD format. So we're going to call those doubles. By the way, I'm going to stop doing this at one and go and have a rest because I'm not at all sure I'm going to be able to get through all of this. But uh, in fact, it's fairly likely I won't. But you can at least see what I have to go through every time I do a plugin. The bright side is that once I do have a working VST plugin, I can kind of cross compile it in different virtual machines and get the results out of that without doing this every single time. But it's going to take me a bit to do this. So let's open up um, plugins VST by quad because some of this stuff is by quads and when I have by quads Oh, I see that I'm defining it as 11s anyhow. That's interesting. So I'm probably wasting a little space with the biquads in the AU because those are dual mono. So it's instantiating a new one every time it runs. So it's not actually using all of the size of this. But that does mean I've already specified this properly. So let's put this away for now. I was only checking to see if it was the right thing. That means that this 
AU version, as you can see, it's in the AU category, is probably the wrong number of value uh, variables here. But that's not my primary concern. My primary concern is each of these need to have a separate buffer. And each of these need to have a separate buffer because when I go to the audio unit version, which is not here, but in window AU, if you find this confusing, so do I, trust me. Here, when we instantiate these, we're setting all the feedback to be zero. That's going to be easy. Each channel has its own in the VST. In the AU, it will define a new version of this for both channels. Each channel will have the same sizes of the buffers, but and they will end up with the same uh, scaling of the buffers each time. But each of these vibrato parameters must be different for each one on each channel. Because I'll tell you what that does, and it does it on the AU as well, but it will also do it on the VST. If you have a dual mono and both of the channels are exactly the same, and you put a reverb sound, just a tick or a snare hit or something, in the middle, theoretically, that's going to produce exactly the same result for both channels. So your middle sound will continue to sit in the middle and not spread or fill up the space with a stereo. But if they have vibratos to them, so that there's a frequency variation going on, and you've instantiated the vibratos as random factors, those aren't going to be the same. So the stuff that you produce in the middle, which is a lot of sounds really, will start centered and then the reverb will spread. And that's what I'm shooting for with this. So I'm going to need to do separate values for all of this stuff but not the biquad because the biquad will work as a stereo effect with um, this set of variables. Oh, and I've got some more float 64s. We've got lots of those. In fact, a find and replace would do all of those, but I don't want to start thinking about what finding and replacing is at the moment because I'm thinking about what two channels of things are. that being the main problem with doing this. So what we're going to do, the biquad gets to be two channels all by itself, but this other stuff does not. So we're going to duplicate it and we're going to call them lefts and right channels for all these different things. Because it keeps it pretty like direct and obvious doing it this way. It's primitive and crude, but it also is dead obvious what's going on at every point. Now, if I was to compile this, it would give me a problem of um, redefining the variables. So, going through and calling those ones left and Typo. Those ones right. And same deal for all this kind of stuff. And all this is going to follow this pattern of kind of chugging along and duplicating it all, but changing all the names a little bit. So same deal. Oh. Talking about it slows me down. Now, people normally do things like, oh, I'm defining a special class in order to instantiate these things within the program so that every time you do it, it's actually going to load a whole separate class. And then there's a part of the class that you tell whether it's left or right. And let's make an expanded class so that it could be quadraphonic. And then you'd be able to tell it whether it's, oh, and I just done fucked up, didn't I? Excuse me. Excuse my language.
That's not what I should have done at all. This is. Then. Also, I usually do this in a different configuration, namely sitting in a chair rather than leaning over a microphone with thus and so, so my hands are not in the same positions they would be, and that's slowing down this part enormously. But, yeah, it's only 12.33. I have like 27 more minutes of this, and I still won't have gotten finished. No bookmark. What did I do? Uh... Save, that's what I wanted. And then same deal here. Because these have to be, well, feedback doesn't actually, I may want to fool with that. Let's have a look at what the code actually does. This depth is confusing me a bit. This aspect of the biquads will be the same and not change. I'm going to be digging up the direct form of the stereo processing for this. So that is going to be the same. What does depth do? Am I even using it? Yes, I am. Depth times vibrato speed. So, vibrato A is changing, and that's actually the position on the sine wave. Vibrato speed is how fast we're progressing through the sine wave, and depth is a fixed amount that's not going to change. So we do not need multiple versions of that. We do need multiple versions of vib A through H. I'm just kind of glancing over this stuff and trying to figure out whether I can see how this works. We also don't need special versions of delay because that's going to be the same across channels. That's not the part that needs to have a special version. Feedback is, however, stereo. So there's going to need to be a dedicated version of the feedback parameter because that's not going to be the same on both channels. So basically our simplest way of doing that is to get rid of this depth stuff. No movement and dynamic convolution as far as me working on it lately. Hang on, that was wrong. I do actually want that semicolon, but I don't need this comma. Or this space. It's honestly, I think, easier doing stuff from scratch because then the sort of experiment mo experimental mode of it is fine. But with this, I just have to remember a lot of really pedantic, boring stuff, and it's just throwing me off. No, no, no. The kind of thing where you wind up doing too much of this and you're cursing loudly at the computer for hours on end as you gradually you grind through all of this. Vibe does need to have two separate versions of everything. And yeah, what I started to do as far as making fun of people doing this kind of thing is when they go, I'll do a special class and it will have cases for the left and right, and we'll also make it do cases for the up and down and the quadratic, quadraphonic things. So you can define whether it's quadraphonic and what you call it, and you wind up writing a million things and never coding anything. And that's no fun. 
And then when you do, you have to remember how all the classes work. So this actually should get us there. Now that said, what else am I looking at? So that's our matrix verb H. And here's some more stuff. Remember how we needed to have two more other than the five here? Same deal. E, F, and G. Those are not necessarily all zeros. Let's go find out what they were supposed to be. We'll go away from the old uh, C++ file and back from this, which was the AU, to see what it told us about what the AU said. And the AU says the first one, which is A here, is going to be 1. And then E and F are 0 0.5. And the last one is also going to be 1. Let's do that. And that should have our parameters correctly set. Now what we have to do is go and expand all of this out into the seven parameters from the five that it currently has. So let's see, follow the pattern. That's why I do it this way, is it's under patterns and it's pretty straightforward. Remember when we count seven, if we count from zero, we're counting zero to six. If I do alphabetical order, it's EFG, so that's easy to see as well. We don't have to change pin parameter because that's just being called from here, but we do have to go through every single one of these and update it. Following the pattern, same deal, five and six, because it's counting zero to six because there's seven parameters. And every single case, Stop it. Notice how it selected the colon. I don't want that. Also, we've defined these things, so they are, in fact, showing up. If I did H by mistake, that would not turn blue. But G has been defined, so that does. Same pattern here. This is now going to handle five... Uh, seven parameters, same deal here. This is how I keep this stuff approachable. It expands outwards and gets more and more convoluted and demanding, but as long as it's following patterns and being really primitive, it's not going to lose me too severely. And I think we're even going to keep one of these things the way it is. F and G, F, G. And the last one is actually going to be dry wet, if I'm not mistaken. So that's going to be fine. This is a good enough time, I think, to uh, put the names in. So filters are top. Jay, well, thank you. I'm trying to stay safe and healthy. I think anybody that's a real programmer watching this would think they were watching the programming of somebody that was mentally retarded. And, you know, they wouldn't be so far wrong, maybe, but I still get my results. And sometimes folks like that who are so clever and so much better programmers than me don't get the results, so go figure. This is my strange way of going about it. These are selected to be the same length. I picked this stuff out so that it would fit into the most primitive form of VST, which lets you have like seven letters and that's it. There are hosts that let you have more, but I often find that they just only let you have seven letters because KVST max param string length comes from something that I think is part of the VST standard and other people may override it, but I don't see where it is, so I haven't been overriding it for fear of breaking some host out there somewhere.
And then lastly, let's make sure we've got FNG for a get parameter display. We may also be, I'm not sure whether I have anything coherent here as far as making the label be special. There are some hosts that just show a zero to one no matter what you do. What this is supposed to do, as you can see in this instance for k param e, is it's supposed to let you do stuff like if it is zero through options of zero through four and you're picking one of a set of options, you should be able to show this in the, the interface and it will write text for you. That said, it doesn't always work. And here's two different options. One of them is db to string, which will show you whatever the zero to one factor is as a db value. And then the switch there is show me these options as a item in a selected list. Monitoring uses this. Monitoring works that way on some uh, hosts and some hosts just show you zero to one, which is dismaying and doesn't work. And I have no way to fix it because that's just what the thing is doing. Up oh, a little bit more. This actually doesn't matter, but I'm keeping the pattern going. As you can see, all of this does literally nothing. Get parameter label in all these instances is just blank. If I had speed in terms of MPH, I could type that in here and some hosts would indicate speed as zero to one, but it would be an MPH. And you could tell it in the parameter display up here, if one is 200 MPH, you'd tell it C times 200, and it would give you this big floating point number. And instead of going to zero to one, it would show it as zero to 200. And then you'd have C say 200 MPH and so on. But we're not doing that here. I'm just saying that's how you would do it if you did. And that's the end of matrix verb CPP, which brings us to the guts of where we do all of our hard work. Namely, matrix verb pros. Here is process replacing for 32-bit. And then down here is process double replacing for 64-bit. And we're getting in like float inputs here and double inputs here. And sample frames is a 32 bit integer. VST int 32 is VST's definition of what kind of integer they want. I don't know how that differs from if you just had int, like int. I don't know how this is different, but they have it this way. So I'm assuming they must do something interesting here. And here's where we start digging through, not this stuff, because we've already done this, not this stuff, because we've already copied it, but actually, hang on. I think I might have to go back. You know why? Because, uh, yeah, save that. I don't think I've instantiated these things yet. Remember how we had in the middle of the, um, AU here, again, this is the AU version. Reset. Reset starts things off as zero. You want to be able to do that. Um, so it does this stuff here. So what we're going to do is copy this over. We're going to leave this FPD there. And then we're going to go back to this being our VST version, which is sitting on the desktop at the moment, which is where I've got the new version to do. This is now defining our parameters, our sliders correctly. And it's starting the FPD and it's giving each of the FPDs a new variable, but it's not doing any of that. So I just copied this over from the AU, but it's not stereoized. 
So we gotta go through here and figure out which of these things, which should be mentioned here, which of these things count as a uh, something that I need to make stereo or not. So that's what we're looking at here. You might or might not be able to see it, but I'm gonna put it here so that I can see it. Therefore, I'm gonna want these to be doubled up. And one of the ways I can do that is, actually I can do that even better. Here's one of my little shortcuts. Rather than copying them over, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through and alphabetize. B, C, D, E, F, G, H. And now I'm going to uh, left and right eyes them. Again, a rather mechanical. The nice thing about this mechanical stuff, although again, real programmers would think I was an absolute bozo for this, but I don't have to think about what my fingers are doing. And I don't have to conceptualize anything new about there. As long as I'm doing the correct thing, I can be thinking a couple of steps ahead to what I'll actually be doing when, for instance, coding the, the plugin or whatever. There's a similar factor going on here, which is all of this stuff now needs to be duplicated. So I could do a similar pattern there. See, what I was doing here is they're all being made to be zero. So I can have this be equal to this equal to zero, and it will amount to the same thing. It'll be like zero comes from here, goes through here, and goes into there, and they all end up being zero. And that's something I can use in this pattern as well. So copy, paste it, and then dive into here. The reason they're not being all done in one big pile is because they're only being expanded out as far as they need to be. These are not the same size of a array. So you can see they only go out as far as they need to. And same deal with alphabetizing. P, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. I can actually do this with my finger on one keyboard. I've been doing this for so long that it's like, and then there's the P. My fingers are used to doing that already. Oh, and I missed one. M is our pre-delay. And same deal as before. Now we mechanically and pedantically go through and make them be our left and right versions, which are going to be just plainly there. Hmm. H is J, is it now? Hmm. You're right, thank you. And that would be a bug that would catch me out later it would probably, actually no it wouldn't, it would just have that being a random value, thank you. Doing, doing this on stream is more challenging than otherwise, but that is the kind of thing that will sometimes catch me. Imagine if you were doing that and your H was in the definition of a class. Doing the fancy programmer stuff doesn't necessarily save you from all of that, you see. But yeah, that ought to have done it. So now have the delay buffers defined as a giant pile of stereo reverb. Now count and delay. Why do I have that? I've told the delay to be uh, Stereo, why do I have delay to be stereo? Oh, this is the VST. Did I'm, where is, uh, window. Yeah, 
yeah, copied it from that, closed it. These delays may or may not have a purpose for being stereo. You know, they don't need to be stereo, do they? Alrighty, so back over to the desktop version, which is our VST. And we really don't need separate versions of this because they're always going to be consistent with each other. It's just the vibrato that is the distinguishing factor. So we're removing this definition. We don't need it to do that. absolutely did not need delay to be that. We can tidy this up also in another way, but for the time being, I super don't care. Um, by the way, notice that uh, when you're defining things like this, you can do commas ending with the semicolon, but only if they're the same kind. So those are both ints, so they get to be ints. And those are doubles, so they get to be doubles. But you can't do an int and then a double in there in the comma. So let's see, there's our C++ file, and then here is where we're defining variables. So and one unhelpful thing is that I am using the, uh, I'm defining this in the beginning rather than inside the loop. I could just as well be defining this in the loop, and then I'm using count and then count with the letter. These are totally different variables, so there's no special reason why they should be this way. It is a uh, cumbersome thing, but meh, no point changing it now. And count, I believe, does end up being different, but the delay does not. So what we're going to do is, again, expand that out and then make them left and right because count is affected. It's the position in the delay buffer. It is affected by the vibrato parameter. So when that's not exactly the same on both sides, it's going to make count be different on both sides. And that's why we'll end up having stereo spread. Depth was not stereo, so we're going to leave that the same as well. And remember to do the pre-delay. I think that's going to work. And then remember to alphabetize these. That's not alphabetizing, that's a typo. It's going to be a real derpy. We'll see how far we get. No, no, no. H, G, H. I can spell just barely. In my advanced mental decline, I can still do some of these things. Hooray. And now we do the left-right versions. And you'll see that the, do, the two versions are distinguished by having L and R on the end of them. And they're right visibly there. There's no abstraction to it at all. Which one of the things about that is that it also shows you that twice as much is happening. And you can arrange it in such a way where you're doing, um, if it benefits you to do all of something first and only then to do all of something else, you get to do that by doing it this way rather than doing some subclass and then calling the class twice at which point it does, it's like counting or arranging or something like that on one channel and then goes off and does completely other things and then returns and does it on the other channel. It could potentially be more efficient to 
like multiply everything by depth A. If you need to do that on two separate channels, maybe you want to just load depth A into memory and then do your multiplies on both sides with that one thing. That's not what you'll get on uh, audio unit, which just runs it twice for each channel. But it is possible to kind of optimize a little bit in that way. Although one thing I did, my, my brother always taught me, and uh, do believe it, that uh, never assume optimizing will work. CPUs do amazing things, and you can't count on doing something and going, this must be easier for it. Not, not necessarily. They do stuff like branch prediction. There's a lot of stuff that they do that's just a lot trickier. And see what we're doing here? This is very important. I can't just do vib a equals vib a equals rand long min because they need to be different for each side. So we're literally calling random an extra eight times. And depth doesn't change. Let's see now. Okay. So delay is the same for both sides. Count is left and right ized. Depth doesn't change, so it's the same for both sides. And vibe does absolutely change, so we're going to go through and do our lefts and rights. This is not the hard part. The hard part's coming up. Hey, stop that. Except for we're about to stop. But in theory, we've probably done these two things. leaving us the C++ file and matrix verb proc. So what we're going to be doing, and I'm feeling like I ain't doing that today. This is, you, you've just had a taste of what I normally do with this stuff, which I will not always stream. I would rather stream the creating of new stuff where you can listen to things over the little speakers and so on. This is the dumb, boring part, but I thought I would subject you to it. This gets done for every plugin that gets made into a VST. They're not all this complicated. Sometimes they're a lot easier, but uh, this is what you get. Why did it just open the each file? So there's proc, here's CPP, and this is the part that we copied that is a reset. And here's what we do with the head of it is start from the sample rate thing. Note that we, we spell sample rate differently for each one. And copy this. And the analogous, analogous place here is from sample rate to, again, another while statement. Both of these are setting up things and then counting through the entire buffer, which is what, where your latency comes from, to do it sample by sample. So what we're going to do here is, firstly, we're doing this in the 32-bit version. And uh, when we're done, we go through and copy everything that we've got other than this double part over to double replacing so that it's exactly the same. So right now, what we've got there is basically nothing. We take out all of this uh, dummy code, and you wind up, oh, hang on, undos. I think we are actually using dry wet. So we don't actually get rid of that bit because we're going to be using it. No sense having to retype it. but. The rest of this gets emptied out, much the same as in here. That's just dummy code. That is what sits inside this. Right now, this will do basically nothing. But this part up in the top, by quad 0 through what 6 or whatever this is, is going to be consistent for everything. Whereas we're going to be running a different biquad routine than the one we have here. Because the one we have here is mono. 
and we have a version of BiQuad. Let's see. I think this is the VST. Yep. We have a version of BiQuad that can do left and right because see how it's counting it's, it's using like eight and nine or seven and eight or nine and ten this is arranged in such a way where you can use the same numbers for the calculations but we're keeping a stereo pair in here so we're actually going to be using that we're going to be copying that over rather than what was in the other one i'm, I'm getting a little scattered and bouncing around a little bit here this is sort of thing that might well happen rather than using this one which as you can see that input sample it's also a slightly different arrangement i think but uh, uh or yeah it's a slightly different form does the same thing That is the one. So let's see, one of the first things we end up doing is that uh, bike white there. And let's just grab some more of this stuff from here. Nope, that is the, got to figure out whether I'm looking at the AU or not. So one of the things that happens here is, the, here is the mono audio unit version Here's the pre-delay. The pre-delay happened before hitting the by quad. So we'll just, before doing this, let's just demonstrate the way this is done. You see, this is a stereo version. It has lefts and rights. So a thing we can do is, delay M is the same for both channels. Count them, however, is not, I don't think. So we could do something like this. Left, right, left, right. Right, because the count variable is the one that differs, that's different for the actual reverb parts that have the vibrato in them. Those vibratos are different, so the count ends up different. This will never actually end up being different, but we're kind of using the same factor. So this is going to look the same. However, it'll show up that... Uh, If we were updating those differently, we'd wind up with two separate ones that were following the same rules because it's just copied over. And then since it's the pre-delay, oh, stop it, pop-up menu, I didn't ask for you. Eh, yelling at the pop-up menu. We are adapting all these bits to be the stereo version. So now we have a stereo pre-delay instead of a mono pre-delay. Although one thing we could do is, since the pre-delay does not have the stereoness, we really don't need count to be left and right. Count is not getting a separate value. Now, since we're doing this change in the VST version, rather than being all in the one file, it's in three different files. So we go back to matrix verb CPP, go up to the top and up here. We can correct that so that now we have only the one uh, count in there and then back to proc. If we get this correct, then we can copy it over and have it be the 64-bit version. 
Oh, God. Uh, where was I? Well, here's the VST, so... Note that there's a couple of other things I'm going to have to do as well. A bunch of this needs to be updated to work with the VST versions. The LAM doesn't change, so now we can take out one of these because we've updated that. And only one instance of that. And these stay left and right, but we are only looking at that offset of both of them. And that is now a more tightly arranged with less calculation stereo pre-delay. This is our biquad filter copied off of uh, the VST version of literally biquad. It looks very similar to what's in the AU matrix verb. And at this point, I start basically just going through here and stretching stuff out bit by bit to get to where I need. For instance, I'm going to want to make both of those channels apply. And we're going to be doing a stereo version of these as well. That processing is stereo. This is going to be doubled up as well. And it's all being made into a two channel version in the most relentlessly primitive fashion just so that everything is up front and like right in front of your face. Because when I'm feeling incredibly stupid, it helps. And we go through this whole process for all of this. I'll copy this over and make it be a stereo. And I'll note that the second time around, I won't need to use this all pass temp and define it. I can just continue this pattern here of I define it and then I start using it over and over again and for the right versions I can continue to use that over and over again so we'll just be from four to eight first ones will be left second ones will be right same deal with this I might even keep this competent out bit although I probably don't have to but uh, I could just as well get rid of that but um, again copy that and do I have stereo feedback? I think I have stereo feedback. I think feedback is generated by the individual channels, so it can't be mono. Copy that, paste it down twice, make it left and right versions. Count is stereo, so that will be updating. Now this has me thinking, it's always trouble. Um, count offset is the part that matters here. Offset is the sine waves. Count is not going to be different for either of the sides. Offset is going to be different. Working A will need to be different because working A is count plus offset. Offset is going to be a left and right version because it is affected by vibe, which is different for each version. Count won't need to be. And working is where we get our actual reading here. And then all this stuff is going to be stereo. And feedback is going to be stereo because all of this was already stereo and so on. 
And then here is another um, filter. Again, this is the AU version, so I'll be cop I'll be getting that from possibly the top of the file and then changing it from A to B in the BiQuad. And then this is going to be stereo, and that's the third, the BiQuad C. So one thing I could do to save myself trouble is go into let's see VST. If I go into BiQuad triple, I will have examples of this stuff where, see how it's doing this on input sample, which is much what I'm going to, well, kind of what I'm going to, let's see whether it's exactly the same or not. That's the, yeah, it's going to be left and right. So I'm going to use this form, but here is where I can get copies of these things already labeled by quad B and by quad C. This is what I had uh, starting off. Although I would also point out that, um, oh no, wait, no. It's correct for this to be here because it's the seven, eight and the nine and the 10. So I'll be using that for these forms of the by quad. So yeah, I have a lot of fiddly busy work to do. And one thing which I wouldn't want to forget. So before I leave, which I'm going to leave, um, I am going to step through the thing that I needed to fix. That's as follows. Count is not changing. In fact, I'm not doing a pitch bend on the all passes. That's one of the things I was going to experiment with, but not right here. Count is always the same. Offset is count plus the thing that varies per channel. So I can leave this the way it is. I don't have to copy this over because this can be exactly the same as it was. So we have to go back to all three files again. And would you look at that? I never had to count any of those at all because that was going to be fine. Just the way it was. Our pitch bends are not count being different between channels. Our pitch bends are a additional factor being added to it and count is the same each time. So this is going to be a little bit slow, but I need to do it before I shut the machine off and go and lay down. Need to get this updated in every place that it needs to be. Don't need those multiple copies of it. There we go, those are blanked out. Depth also doesn't change. Only thing that changes is the vibrato and then offset is declared in matrix verb pros. And that's our AU again. Let's close that for a moment because we're not doing all of this right now. And let's look up at the top. These things are about right. This is this is how we're doing that uh, filtering for it is staggered filters rather than them all being exactly the same. It's part of how it gets its sound. And the biquads, I don't know yet, Robert. 
Also notice, let's, let's do some of these things while we're at it. Every time it says float64, that's not okay. VSTs don't know what that is. Every time it has to be updated and changed to a double position floating point number, which should be 64 bits. But also, wait, there's more. VST doesn't know what this is either. The values I'm using for that are A for zero, uh, the, the first one anyway. That's gonna be C for parameter three. D for parameter four. E for parameter five. Parameter two is obviously gonna be B. F for parameter six. And G for parameter seven. We could handle this differently as well, but uh, wouldn't make any functional change. And in theory, this won't do anything, but this will probably compile or not. You see, we've got a little, we got another problem. I'll show you what it is. Firstly, uh, I edited out where it made, where it said wet. Although we could actually fix this but we also have to change this. Notice how I copied this over from the AU. See how this is different? That's a lowercase g. That's an uppercase g. We have to make that one small change. Now it's talking VST language. And also, we're going to be wanting to do this anyway. And I've just updated these bits. They're not, they're unused because we haven't got the rest of it in there. But we've just updated these bits this is what goes in the other one. So this is also where we got wet and it says what was not declared. If I copy and paste this, it will be declared now. And it's not gonna run because that stuff wasn't done either, but. Let's give it another try and see how far it got. Some of this stuff, the unused variables are fine because we'll get to those. But we also have a mistake up here. And it is this. That mistake can be fixed by what I was going to do elsewhere. Open recent project by quad triple. By quad triple is the one that has the A, B, and C on it. Therefore, if I go into the VST version of it and grab the bit that I needed, which was A. And I replace this stuff here, which is just generic by quad sort of template code. I'm not going to replace that because that was something else. Now it says A but it didn't otherwise change. And then if I build this, the build succeeded, although it's got all these warnings because we haven't really done most of it yet. I've done a small fraction of it and it's already 20 minutes past one. This is, this is work, but um, that's gonna do it for now. Uh, this is how this process rolls. And it may seem like a really stupid process, but there's a reason behind lots of bits of it. Part of it is to just see how all this stuff works. And you've seen how difficult some of that is for me. So it also helps not having it get into all forms of abstraction and different classes and things. And uh, this last hour and a half, and probably another hour and a half or more is what I do for every AU that I adapt to VST. Sometimes they're a little easier. Like if the AU is already stereo, it's going to be a lot quicker. But um, it's adapting it over to a format where rather than being able to do two channels automatically, 
you have to do two channels manually to do a stereo VST, which I believe is the default for how those work. And on that note, it's been a weird, long day, and this very plugin, Matrix Verb, you should see next Sunday. It seems very plausible I'll be able to finish this up by then. And uh, as we go, you'll start to see some of the other ones. I don't know whether it makes sense to do... Like, honestly, I should dial back that uh, Infinity stuff I was doing and design a whole new version of Infinity that's designed around going with those very long buffers. Because the thing of it is, I can still do a householder matrix and have different sequences. Uh, it can be a different overlaps and things. Anyways, boy, I gotta, I gotta go rest. Uh, let me see now. Bye to live chat. Your window is gonna go away now. Boop. And yeah, you shall have a matrix verb and following that, probably the one just called reverb, which is more approachable, I think. And after that, infinity and maybe other stuff filtering in with their, depending upon what I do in future Monday coding streams, because it's kind of more fun when I do something creative. I've just had you sit through more than an hour of this grunt work that's not even super intelligent programmer style grunt work. This is like primitive programmer grunt work. And I have no problem with that because like I said before, the folks that can program so cleverly and do this all with so much more intelligence don't think of the stuff I think of. So you're going to have to deal with me doing it. And it, this is also some of the reasons why my stuff runs efficiently. It's not buried in abstractions. There's a lot of code out there including, for instance, what you're probably looking at right now, which is Chrome or maybe Firefox. But something like Chrome is so buried in abstractions that it's not even funny. And everything slows down and you wind up needing faster and faster computers to do the same old things. I don't like that, so I do stuff kind of old school and in this primitive way. And it does have its merits. People just, uh, some people just find it ugly. But my hope is also that people who are trying to learn how to do this, since everything is just out there on the table for you and like directly right in front of you to be seen, I'm hoping that makes it more approachable. Because I have big problems quite often following other people's code when they got too much into the abstraction thing. And at one point I wanna walk you through some of that. I have a example which is a version of, I don't know whether it was Purist Drive or something like that, but uh, I have a instance of a Air Windows plugin where my brother took it and abstracted it out as far as it could possibly go as a challenge. So we can dig into that once. And uh, at, at some point we can dig into that. We can look into the version of Purist Drive, which ran and it didn't function any differently. It might've run a little bit more slowly, but not necessarily. But um, you're not gonna believe what Dan did to this stuff. It's a real object lesson in what you can, how far you can go in terms of making everything heinously abstracted and weird and everything invoking everything else. And you look at that and you go, where does it even begin? Where does it even end? How does it even work? And the path of wisdom, I feel, is really kind of a blend. It's like some ways between. Because there is some merit to that. Like I learned to define things where they were being used from Dan. That's why some of this stuff, you know, it's saying double vib speed somewhere or in the middle of the main loop. 
Uh, I learned that from Dan. Before, I was defining stuff all in a separate file or elsewhere, and then just using everything. And it does make a lot better sense to keep stuff confined to within the context that they run. My stuff ran better when I started doing it. It's just that if you get too abstracted, everything has to do a lot of extra work. And the computer can do it, and it might not even notice that it's being asked to do it, but never can tell. Anyways, that's enough for now. I will talk to you later. Bye-bye. And have a happy rest of 2020, because the next time I see you, it's going to be 2021, and 2020 will be over. It will be over. And I think we'll all be grateful for that. Bye-bye.